PNR Networks is a member of Patreon. Show your love for our shows by joining our ongoing fundraising campaign and get some fantastic perks in return. Check it out and become a Patreon sponsor. You can sign up at patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, backslash PNR Networks. And thanks for your support. This podcast is a member of the Blueberry Network. Blueberry. No ease. That's Blueberry, B-L-U-B-R-R-Y. Dot com. Blueberry dot com. This podcast is a proud member of the Lamb Podcasting Network. Find the network at largeassmovieblogs.com. It's Kim versus TC in the battle of the lists. My list is better. My list is better. My list is better. No, it's not. My list is better. Kim or TC, who has the better list? From Subject Cinema, this is Front Row 5 and 10 with Kim Brown and T.C. Perkham. Hey everybody, welcome to another week here on Front Row 5 and 10, brought to you by the good people that bring you Subject Cinema. That would be me and him, the me part of that being Kim Brown. And the him part being T.C. Kirkham. Mm-hmm. Uh, this was, uh, our, we took the week off last week because we wanted to do this show on the week as we're ready to speak. Rogue One is ready to hit theaters, and this is a Star Wars themed show that Kim came up with. Go ahead and talk about it. Um, I figured in honor of Rogue One... Originally, I just came up with it because it, we were doing this during the month Rogue One was coming out, but now we're doing it the week uh, Star Wars, uh, the next Rogue One, the, a Star Wars story yes, is the title of the, the movie. next film. And it was well, actually not the next film in the Star Wars no, saga. This is, it's this, actually, is, this is the first standalone film. Yes, it it's is. not part of the saga. Won't have a crawl. No. Won't have an in credit sequence that you guys will like either, from what I hear, but we'll see what happens. Hmm. Um, it is. Reviews have been divided so far, but mostly are on the positive side. It is a film set before Star Wars Episode Four: A New Hope. Um, Star Wars. It's set before Star Wars. Okay? Honestly. I refuse to do the Episode Four: A New Hope crap. Anyway, go ahead. Anyway, before I was so rudely interrupted, um, it is the film that is is dealing with how we get to where we got to. Way back in the 70s. Ow. I know, it's a little confusing. Um, but this show is our our list show, and we are looking at, in our opinions, the five best moments from the Star Wars extended universe and the five worst moments from so, well, the Star I Wars extended universe. I actually called it the, my top five Star Wars universe moments and my bottom five Star Wars universe moments. That's fine. That works too. And we should clarify... The Star Wars Extended Universe, we have we have decided, are the films, mm-hmm. the three TV series that came in the 90s and 2000s, which are Gindy Tartakovsky's Clone Wars and the later Clone Wars and, and Star Wars Rebels. Mm-hmm. And, wait for it, the two Ewok movies. <laughs> we did not bring in Ewoks and Droids, the cartoon series, because it's not canon. No. So... That's how far we went. And there's, I'll be honest, there's nothing from Rebels on my list, at least. And, Me neither. And so it's, we've never really sat down and gone into it. So, all right. So, do you want to start? I mean, I'll start, like always, when you come I think up the you list. should start. Do we want to do the f- top five or the bottom five first? I think we should do the top first. Really? <laughs> yeah, you, don't you? I would have thought we'd start with the bottom and okay. end with the top. Yeah, all right. All right. Well, yeah, we'll get, we'll get the bad stuff out of the way. Right. And then exactly. end the show talking about the good stuff. Okay. Okay, that's fair. My bottom five Star Wars moments. I'm not, I got to clarify something. This took a lot out of me because I am not the walking Star Wars encyclopedia that Kim and Stacy are. They can quote these the, the, the episodes four, five, and six without a problem. 
one, two, and three in Clone Wars, I don't think you'd be able to. do No, it. I don't think but I the, can. But the other ones, you 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 can. So I've never been a huge Warsy. I am a fan of Star Wars, but I've never been a huge Warsy the That's, way they are. Uh, okay. <clears throat> Just want to clarify that. <clears throat> but I do get the argument that is at my number five bottom moment, and it comes specifically from Star Wars, the special edition released in 1997, right, to theaters? Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, where they did redid all the sound effects and all the... You no, know, a whole bunch of stuff on the new movies, and put in new special effects, and made them updated. George updated them for a new generation, which pissed off all the original fans. And one of the things that has become canon is, and, and this is mostly not just from Star Wars, but this has a lot to do with the Kevin Smith universe too. The 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 ever changing question among Star Wars fans: Who shot first, Han or Greedo? Mm-hmm. They revised the history because you really couldn't tell in the original show, in the original film when it came out in 1977. That wasn't the case in the 20th anniversary edition when Warzies all over the planet got out in the snit when they found out that, uh, according to George at least, it was Greedo. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Which pissed a lot of people off. People wanted Han to be the one that shot first. I don't know why. Because it would have made Han more of a badass. That's and their... a murderer. Well, that um, the guy was holding a gun on him first. Blaster. Well, so what? Anyway, well, um, so that kind of pissed people off, and you know, it's 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 one of the low points of the revamped uh, 1997 version, and forever will break Randall's heart from Clerks. Okay. <laughs> so my number five is revisionist history. Greedo shot first. Okay. That's a good one. <laughs> I was actually kind of panicking for a minute because I was like, oh, crap. Did we think of the same thing? Um, no. All right. My first moment that's really kind of, oh, eh, um, is from uh, Star Wars um, Episode Three: Revenge of the Sith. Um, we can dispense with episodes and with Star Wars. It's Phantom, Clones, Sith, Star Wars, Empire, Jedi. We don't need all the other crap, okay? okay. We'll, otherwise, we'll have like 10 extra minutes of time. All right. All right. <laughs> okay. So, sacrificing class for brevity. Oh, for peace's um, sake. Even Stacy thinks you go overboard with that. Anyway, let's go. Stacy also thinks the Texas Chainsaw Massacre is a comedy and Dexter is a how-to show. <laughs> <laughs> so. True enough. Okay. Hi, Stacey. Um, for the most part, I mean, let's be honest, a lot of Star Wars fans, and I will throw myself in there, um, look at some of the prequels, especially some things about the prequels, especially on my list, um, and there's just a lot of stuff where you're like, they weren't even trying. Um, this was a moment that I felt was not shot correctly and not scripted well. Um, I didn't feel it was in character. After the climactic and, and really terrible battle between Obi-Wan and Anakin Skywalker after Anakin's turn to the dark side, where Anakin barely resembles a human being now and looks more like a piece of jerky. Um, Once he is um, put back together and put into the cybernetic outfit that is keeping him alive as Darth Vader, he's completely made the the change into this cybernetic being. And he's... Uh, you know, trying to get wrap his head around what's happened to him, but also at the forefront of his mind is what happened to Padme, his pregnant wife that he force choked into unconsciousness. And he asks the Emperor, is Padme safe? Is she all right? And the Emperor, who wants Vader completely swayed over to his side and, and completely, you know, cut off from humanity and cut off especially from love, flat out lies and says that in your anger you killed her. And 
Anakin, who went through all of this to try and save Padme's life, turned to the dark side to try and save Padme, completely freaks out, starts lashing out with the Force and crushing medical droids that are in the room with with him and, and the Emperor, breaks the restraints that have been holding him, takes a few steps away from the table that he's been on, which is now tilted down so he could get off the table, and proceeds to bellow out the word no. And it's done in a very movie no way. Y'all know what I mean by that. I won't, you know. It's similar to William Shatner's con. Yeah. (laughs) And a lot of people found this hilarious. And I'm not saying they found it hilarious because, ha ha, look at that man in pain. They felt it was just so over the top and so melodramatic and just didn't work. And speaking as an actress, I agree. It was completely... It felt wrong. It felt... It it just didn't feel right. If I had shot that scene, I would have kept all the breaking stuff and all the and all the stuff getting smashed. I would have just had him say no in a in a voice that was so small and so crushed that the audience would have been straining to hear it. I think that would have been... That wouldn't have worked either. I, see, I think that would have been nope. much more effective. Oh, I, I don't think so, but oh, that's okay. I, okay. Not that the way they did it was any good either, but... Okay, all right, okay. I agree with you. Um, that. My number five, a melodramatic no uh, from Revenge no! of the Sith. Yeah. Um, James Earl Jones or not, it didn't work for me, sorry. Um, was it James Earl Jones? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, I don't remember. I'm going back just a few minutes from that, actually. For my okay. number four. All right. The Jedi race is a religion, or at least it's uh, thought of as a religion, a warrior religion. They are supposed to be compassionate. They are supposed to be um, all-encompassing. They want the best for everyone, which means they don't want the Empire. Right. Well, exactly how you explain compassion when you are a top level Jedi and you are losing your mind and chopping limbs off here and there, even though it's everything against what you've always stood for. My number four, Obi Wan goes crazy at the end of Revenge of the Sith. This battle is okay up to a point, but when Obi Wan starts chopping Anakin's, what, one of his legs, right? And both of his arms? Uh, when one of his arms is already gone, uh, um, he gets both his legs in the other arm. Right. So, basically, he's turned this man into a quadriplegic. How is this compassionate? And then leaves him by a lava stream to, to, to die. How is this compassionate? This is completely against any character that any Jedi ever stood for. I said this since we saw that film. That was a complete, utter dark side moment for Obi-Wan Kenobi. I'm I'm like, okay, yes, we know Ewan McGregor is great in this role and he plays this all fine and well and dandy all through all the films that he's done. But this one moment kind of tarnishes that role, that that character, because Obi-Wan is all about the peaceful part wherever possible throughout the entire run of the movies. Okay. And here, he's so angry at his apprentice. And granted, it comes from the fact that his apprentice slaughtered, you know, dozens of children. That it's, he lets the rage of the dark side take over. And Obi-Wan, being Obi-Wan, would not have done that. My number four, Obi-Wan goes crazy, Revenge of the Sith. Okay, that's an interesting... Take I've said it. that for ten years. I realize you have. I realize you have. I also I don't agree with it simply because I know you don't. You think it's 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 out of compassion for everything else. Well, no, it's just a simple fact that there is somebody lunging at you with a lightsaber. If he wanted to kill him, he could have aimed for his head. But or, that's what know, I mean. Mm. He should have killed well, him. Yeah. Okay. Not left him to die yeah. at, at, the, at the like five feet away from a lava river. Right. But your thing is that he, why did he chop his legs it's off? It's cruel all that? and unusual punishment, uh, okay. and Anakin would have bled out in five seconds anyway. Um, lightsaber wounds are instantly cauterized. 
Are they? Yeah. Always? Yeah. Okay, fine. It's that hot. Fair enough. <laughs> That's why there's there's no blood in Empire when Luke's hand comes off. There's no it's, blood in Empire when Luke's hand comes off because nobody thought of it. Well, it's, anyway. <laughs> I'm just, no, it's so hot that it cauterizes instantly. Anyway. That um, doesn't, that you know, I don't buy that theory because if it cauterizes that wound, there's no way for to, to get it open to attach all the electronic stuff. Well, You'd have to it. destroy all the nerves to get in there. Uh, okay, well, I don't know. <laughs> Any more of these that have an opinion on this, please write to us. Yes, soon. front row at pnrnetworks.com. Okay. Uh, number four for me is from um, Attack of the Clones, one of the other prequels. You, you see a pattern forming here? Now, this one, I, I understand why this was done in the script, I really do, because it had to be done. It had to be done to foster character development to get to where we are later on. I still don't like it. Um, I'm hoping I remember it, because unlike him, I have only seen Attack of the Clones once when we went to the theater on opening night. I hate that movie. Anakin Anakin has been having these nightmares about his mother being in trouble. Okay. So he goes... I he goes back. To, list, yeah. He goes back to Tatooine, and he finds out that the the slave the slave owner Watto sold his mother Shmi to another to another person who who then freed her and married her, and she's been living a, a life as as this man's wife on Tatooine, which is all well and terrific, except. For the fact that Tatooine is not exactly the safest planet in the best of situations. In the worst of situations, you have to deal, especially people who are not in the, what passes in Tatooine as a city. Um, the, the moisture farmers and the people that are out more in the outback. I'm not sure how else to put it. Um, That's actually a good description, I think, yeah. Of Tatooine have to deal with... Uh, raids from the the Tuscan Raiders or the Sand People, as they're known, they're more accurately known as Tuscan Raiders. Mm-hmm. Um, on one of these attacks, Shmi was kidnapped, and so Anakin goes and rescues his mother. He finds her. She's severely tortured. She's been beaten and everything, and it's awful. And he, you know, rescues her holds her in his arms long enough for her to look up at him, recognize him, see him smile, and then die. <laughs> really? <laughs> really, movie? The, we, the, the fortune is in the... Yeah, it's like that. <laughs> I'm, I, I remember sitting there... Yes, this, I was this close to putting this on my I list. I really remember sitting there in the theater and going, <laughs> and she's going to die in three, two, one, yep. Thanks for not disappointing movie. We went to that with a very large group of friends, and everybody was like, oh, come on. Yep, yep. Now, I understand this was character, you know, this this was important to drive home the fact that, you know, Anakin brings her back, her body back, and then goes out back to the, the Raiders um, area, complex, however you want to word it, and slaughters. Everybody, men, women, children, nobody is safe from Anakin's rage. And that scene is actually a really good scene. It's damn scary. You sit there and you're like, oh, crap. This That's is the moment he- the dark side took over. That's the moment that the dark side took hold. It's not the moment the dark side took over. It's the moment it got, know. It got the door open. You know, part three was where it came in. Okay, and, fair enough. But I just felt like... He, she had to die in his arms. She had to die right there. You know, she hung on. She for long that enough long. for him to arrive, even though she had no idea he was coming. She, you know, she. <laughs> it just, I, I was just like, that's lazy. That's so, so lazy. My number four, Shmi's death. I have a lazy moment next too at number three. Okay, you're not gonna like it though. Probably not. And it's the one moment in the Force Awakens that drives me absolutely insane. We have just had Ray and Finn meet. They are now kind of stuck together because of BB-8 and the meddlesome little robot thingy that he is. Although he's cute. 
I can t- I can stomach him way more than I can stomach Olaf. Th- there's there's um I can't stand Olaf. Let's the 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 talk about apples and oranges <laughs> crying out loud. Cute, small sidekick, comic relief. They're the same thing. Um, so. They're running from the bad guys, and they've got to get out of... Where is that? Is that Mos Eisley they're at, or someplace no, close that, to it? No, they're on Jakku. The oh, that's right. They're, on, they're yeah. on Tatooine, yeah. Mm. But they're in the equivalent of Mos Eisley on right. Jakku. Mm-hmm. And they're running, and they're like, oh, I can grab a spaceship. Let's go that way. Oh, okay, we'll run over here. We'll jump in this one. We'll take this one. And it just happens to be the Millennium Falcon. Really? Come on! That's laziness. I'm sorry. I, as much as I love the beloved ship of Han Solo's from all of, I mean, it is an iconic ship in all of science fiction. Yeah, okay, it just happens to be in Jakku's junkyard and Ray can just happen to know how to jump start it and take off. And it just happens to be right where Ray is. Come on, please. That's, that first one was sloppiness on George Lucas's part. This was sloppiness on J.J. Abrams' part. And I'm like, you know, I love that. I mean, you got to have the Millennium Falcon come back somehow. And the commercials made it look really cool. But the way that they did it, I'm just like, oh, really? How, how coincidental? It's one of those, hmm, church lady moments, remember? Okay. No. Number three... It just happens to be the Millennium Falcon from the Star uh, from the Force Awakens. Okay, I'm calling you out on this one. Why? I first of all, your whole oh, such a coincidence, da da da. Now, that's a great attitude to take if you believe in coincidence. If you take the attitude that there is no such thing as coincidence, coincidence, and everything is going to happen because it's been predestined to happen. You know, now we're getting into philosophy. Bull snit. Uh, uh, but the other thing, I, I also have to take you to task in the fact that the Millennium Falcon had been there for a while, that Ray didn't know it was the Falcon. She called it a piece of junk. I know oh, garbage. That. Garbage. I know that. Yeah. I know that. But it just happens to be the Millennium Falcon? No. Sorry. Mm. All right. It doesn't fly with me, and okay. it barely flew as it was. Well, you know. <laughs> um, my number three moment is... I, I I have tried to defend this this action for a few years, but I got to thinking about it, and I was like, you know what, F that. I'm not doing that anymore. I'm putting it on the list, because it is really kind of irritating. When the Star Wars films came back out in the 90s with all of the new, you know, special effects that they could add in now because... The special editions. Yeah, because they exist now. I mean, that's some all of that them, exists. You can't get the original films now. George yeah, won't let them out. I know. Some of them work really well. The whole Praxis wave when the Death Star explodes—that's really cool. Except um, there's no sound in space. But that's no. that's a that's a little quibble. That's it yeah. looks cool. It looks amazing. absolutely looks cool. It looks completely kick ass. <laughs> and then you get to the end of Return of the Jedi. And you get the moment that had people in the theater going, what the beep? Insert whatever you want to use for an expletive there. Although that's not right. What? That did not happen when it came out in the theaters. Because the the the, the sequel, the prequels, hadn't been filmed yet. This was after it was released to DVD. Oh, it was yeah. during the DVD, the DVD Blu-ray release that it happened in 2007. The the revamped and versions came out two weeks in apart in two, 1997. They hadn't even started Phantom Menace at that point. No, you're right. But but you're, I know, yeah. But yeah, but they've they, it's been on the theater screens because people have seen Well, yeah, since yeah. they've re-released them. Right, yeah. But it was done when for the we DVD. Get, I'm right. sorry. Yes, that is accurate. But I'm thinking the the re re release in the theaters. <laughs> it gets very confusing. We are at the end of Return of the Jedi. It is after the battle that has blown up the new Death Star and the oh. Emperor the Emperor has been killed and everything is, you know, on its way to being good again. Things are going to be great now. Um, you know, Luke and Luke is back from 
saving his father, even though his father lost his life, he's, he regained his soul. Um, Han and Leia are in love, and Leia and Luke know they are brother and sister, which makes the kisses from the first two movies really icky. Um, <laughs> and everything's great, and we're celebrating with the Ewoks. And, and apparently, and, that, just, just, just to that point, yeah. apparently the Force doesn't allow you to be able to detect siblings. Because they both have the force in them, and they should have been able to detect that right from the first time they met, you know. Although, yeah, but there, there's a line. In, there is a line in Jedi after <laughs> after Luke says that he tells Leia that she's his that that Leia is his sister. She says something like, "Somehow I've always known." Yeah, and I'm thinking. Then why did you kiss him? I'm thinking two, in Star Wars. Two ki- <laughs> the last two movies, you kissed him. <laughs> White, never forget it. Anyway, uh, anyway, so we see Luke looking off away from his friends who are all celebrating and stuff like that. Since I'm assuming they can't see what he's seeing, um, Leia probably can. She might be able to. I don't know. We really didn't establish no, we it didn't. very much. Um, and he sees Ben come back as a Force ghost, and Yoda come back as a Force ghost, and his father. Now, in the original movie, uh, that role of Anakin Skywalker was played by a British actor named Sebastian Shaw. He is the gentleman that we see at the end of, of Jedi when Luke takes the, 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 the helmet off Vader. Um, and we see him as a Force ghost, smiling, you know, looking at his son and everything's great and stuff like that. And then we get the re-re-release. Same scene... Same Force Ghosts, almost. Instead of Sebastian Shaw as the older Anakin Skywalker, we now have Hayden Christensen cut and pasted in somehow as the young Anakin Skywalker as a Force Ghost. Which makes no sense. And people lost their minds. Including me. Now, for a while, I tried to defend this. I did. My my reason. Oh yeah, she's been defending this against me forever. Yeah, and then I first saw this, and then I finally gave. And then I finally gave up. My my (laughs) attitude at first was, well, maybe what George is trying to say is that, you know, because Anakin went back to being the person that he was. Before he fell to the dark side, maybe that's why now he looks so young. Bullshit! <laughs> you know, the more I think about that argument, the lamer it gets. So, I I just think it was... I don't really know why they felt like they need to do it. I don't know if George Lucas has ever explained it. I I don't... I don't get it! I just... I don't! So, my number three moment from Return of the Jedi, swapping out old Anakin for young Anakin, even though Anakin is dead. Ow. You know, it's it, it's just weird. Mm. So. My number two is kind of a cheater, but it's not necessarily meant to be a cheater. And I will right. pick the one scene, which I really can't pick, because, again, I have not seen this one as much as I could have. I've seen it more than, than clones. But... Star Wars is 40 years old next year. This is this is like the the biggest thing. And over those 40 years, the official canon of the of the of the stories have included a vast expansion of of more and more new characters. You started with the basic characters in Star Wars. Of course, you had Luke and Leia, Han Solo, Chewbacca, um uh, uh, the Vader and and the Emperor they were there all the way through. Plus in that one you had Grand Moff Tarkin and uh, all of Luke's friends that are part of the Rebel Alliance mm-hmm. now, and so on and so Aunt forth. Peru, Uncle Owen, and as and, and as time has gone on, they've added uh, oh and Obi Wan. I don't know if I said Obi Wan. The the uh, they've added more characters to that. Um, you know, in the later movies they would add the Ewoks. They would add. Um, uh, Landau Calrissian um, and all these other characters part of it, Jabba the Hutt, uh, Boba Fett so on and so forth mm-hmm. and then you, they go back to the prequels and you, and you introduce other characters that are important into 
the the canon of the older films. You have the introduce of Queen Amidala, uh, which is Padme. You have the introduction of of uh, Count Dooku yeah. and Darth you have, Maul. You have Qui Gon Jinn, who is Qui Gon Jinn, who Obi-Wan's is Obi Wan's yeah mentor. Jedi Master, and another character and Mace Windu. Another character that was introduced, and it was supposed to be um, supposedly diversity. I'm supposed I'm sure was in action here. But that introduction from very early in Phantom Menace possibly is why the entire group of prequels started off on a bad foot and never did get completely off the ground. Is an annoying character that everyone has hated from the very beginning. My number two moment is the introduction of the monstrosity known as Jar Jar Pinks. <laughs> Now, Jar Jar, could you please? I can't do him. You can do him better than I can. You can do the voice. Misa, not even going to make an effort to try and do that. Thank you. I, I, I am. I'm not, I'm not. I'm not deep enough. I'm sorry. No, but that's close enough. I, I hate this character to my very fiber. Even more. Except, than Olaf? except in Clone Wars, okay. in the cartoon series, Jar Jar was used in three episodes that I can remember. Where he took up quite a bit of time, and he was actually tolerable there. He had actually become likable in one of them, which is terrifying. Um, but overall, the character is pointed at by most people as the one character in the Star Wars universe that everyone universally hates. Um, and I, I have to agree with them. Jar Jar is an abomination on the Star Wars canon, and it would be nice if we could go back and erase him. Uh, unfortunately, he was too much in evidence in all three of the prequels and Clone Wars, and it's like you're never going to get rid of this character no matter how bad you want. So my number two is the introduction and any subsequent scenes involving Jar Jar Banks, with the caveat that he was actually okay on Clone Wars. All right. I didn't include Jar Jar on my list simply because I was like, we know. (laughs) That's why the other thing that will not be mentioned isn't on the list, either of our lists, because we know. It might be on our next lists, though. We'll have to wait till the end of the show to find out what that's going to be. For those of you who don't know what I'm talking about... You you can't name it because you said... No, I know. And well, for those... Let's just say... Happy Life Day. Anyway, go ahead. You could also say, eat me. Um, okay. I didn't N- say it. I know, I know. Um, my number two moment is actually one that you mentioned, but I'm taking it from a kind of different point of view. Okay. My number two is from Revenge of the Sith. It is after the climactic battle on the planet Mustafar, which I thought was a much better battle than you did. You did. No, the battle was fine. I just didn't it's really some like... really great sword work I just that. didn't really like the way Obi-Wan went, kind of like lost his mind. So. Um, there's some really nice sword work in, that, in mm. that fight. So Anakin has gone to the dark side. Obi-Wan is distraught and knows that he is probably <laughs> going to... Not- <laughs> is Well, his whole thing is that he knows that he's been told... By Yoda, that, that you know that that um, Darth Vader, which is what Anakin is known by now, has to be destroyed. And Anakin's all like, "I can't, you know, ask me to do anything else. Ask me to kill Obi-Wan. the em- I'm sorry, Obi Wan is like, ask me to do anything else. Ask me to kill the Emperor. I can't kill him. I love him like a brother, you know, and all this stuff like that. And they wind up in this huge fight on Mustafar, and it's just completely jumping around in lava, like rivers and all this other really cool And he was stuff. true to what he said. He couldn't kill him. He just left him maimed and, and See, died. that's my point. That's where I'm going. That's exactly <laughs> where I'm going. That we get this whole scene where the brave, noble Jedi who believe in mercy and peace above all else leaves a guy with multiple amputations, severely burned, and leaves him to die on the side of a hill. What the hell? You know, I'm like, I just remember sitting there going, where Well, that's the same thing I was talking about. Well, I know, but you were going more towards the whole 
you know. No, all, that's what I meant, pretty okay, much. Uh, yeah, but my, okay. My whole thing is just, I was like, where the hell are you going? Get the hell back here and finish him off. <laughs> now, I mean, <laughs> yeah. I realize that sounds incredibly callous, and I know some people out there just probably. Jedi would have mercy. They would kill him. Yeah, I know some people probably just clutched their pearls and were like, oh, think of the children. But, you know, I just. No, Anakin didn't, so why should they? Ew. Rude. Anyway, Accurate. um I know. It it was just I I just felt I mean, obviously Anakin couldn't die because he has to become Darth Vader for the other movies to actually happen and we right, know. Right, but that. they could have come up with a better way to do it. But before, seriously, think. even if he had been dead for like a second and resurrected through some dark thing of the force or something like that, I would have been fine with that. Just Obi-Wan walking away, leaving him lying there, burning. Toodles. Bye. I was just, I was like, what the actual hell? <laughs> you know, I just. No, so, you weren't. You were what the actual. Beep. So my number two, the aftermath of the final battle in Revenge of the Sith. So. Yay. Back to you. Uh, my number one's already been mentioned, and I don't really have to go into it because she said it all. My number one is replacing Sebastian Stan, uh, Sebastian Shaw with Hayden Christensen at the end of the special edition DVD version of Revenge of uh, Return of the Jedi. What the actual hell? I'm sorry. Um, Obi-Wan is still Alec Guinness. He's not Ewan McGregor, and he's long dead at this point. Yoda is... CGI and not a puppet anymore, but still, it's Yoda. Wh- wh- how how come suddenly young Anakin is there? He's younger than his son at this point. Yeah. What the hell are you doing? Not to mention the fact that I just can't stand Hayden Christensen. There's, I mean, in all fairness, in that film, the third film, he's much better. Yeah, he is. But I like the way that he was played in Clone Wars by the voiceover actor that did him much better than any of the live action films. Clone Wars is actually my favorite Star Wars product, period. I loved that show. Mm-hmm. It was awesome. And um, I, I, I was so incensed when we saw this version on TNT for the first time about four years ago. And I'm like, we're, we're watching the end of it and we're like, what the hell? What What is this? Why is Hayden Christensen there? I don't know what went through George Lucas's head. I don't know either. He had too many, he had too many pot brownies, I think, when that happened. My number one, 30-something, uh, 20-something Anakin Hayden Christensen replaces 50-something Anakin Sebastian Shaw at the end of the DVD Blu-ray special edition of Return of the Jedi. Okay. <laughs> now we get the painful stuff out of the way. Now let's do we get stuff. Oh, number one. Uh, do, oh yeah, I do. I'm sorry. Whoops. I Trying to I, skip your top one, huh? I no. Sorry. All right. My number one moment is the. It is really the moment when during the the first of the prequels during the Phantom Menace. I mean, I would. I'll be honest. The first, you know, the first stuff we're dealing with in Phantom Menace. You know, the whole, uh, you know, introducing us to Qui-Gon Jinn and Obi-Wan as a younger man and all this stuff, that that's all fine. When when they team up with Jar Jar, I'm like, um, <laughs> I remember getting this sinking feeling in the pit of my stomach, like, I don't really think I like where this is going. And then we get to this part of the movie, mm-hmm. and I, I was like... Okay, which part? One word. Midichlorians. Oh, yes. <laughs> this whole definition that there are these organisms inside everyone that communicate with the Force and make the Force, a- us able to reach out and touch the Force and communicate with the Force and all this stuff like that that Qui-Gon is explaining to young Anakin and uh, in, in, um, played by Jake Lloyd. And I'm sitting there and I'm just like, what? <laughs> What? We didn't what? see it until what? Two weeks after it came out. Yeah, we first got yeah. to the theater to see it, and Stacy had already warned us. It yeah, was their opening night. She was she was furious. Yeah, I I, I mean I was just like, <laughs> Mido, what did he just say? And and it just I kept hearing it, and I kept 
I just, my jaw kept getting lower and lower and lower. And I was like, what are they doing to my universe? <laughs> what are they doing? What is George lost his mind? You know, and I just remember sitting there going, it's going to get better. It's going to get better. It's going to get better. Please. <laughs> Please? There were moments in Phantom Menace that were not terrible. No, I and know. One of them almost made my top five. I'll one of them made minute. my top five. So, okay. you know. But that was, I was like, midichlorians. Jack, please! You guys want to, you, you want to you save yourself two hours and 15 minutes of, of pain? You want to get into the Star Wars universe? You've never seen the prequels and you want to save yourself two hours and 15 minutes of pain? Easily. Skip Phantom Menace and play The the Saga Begins by Weird Al Yankovic. The entire story is in that song. It's five minutes long. That's it. You don't need to do anything else for Phantom Menace. It's all right there. The sad thing is that statement is completely <laughs> accurate. And I totally enjoy it. I know. It. I had a friend when we played it, when we programmed it at DiscJockey.com, who worked there, who hadn't seen it yet. He's like, thanks. I'm like, what? Well, I'm out now. I don't even see the movie. The whole damn story is right there in the song. I'm like, what am I supposed to do? I can't warn you about stuff like that. It I'm, was one of Weird House's biggest hits. It's I'm like, Kim, okay. I'm Kim Brown, and I endorse this, I endorse this message. <laughs> so my number one moment from The Phantom Menace, midichlorians. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ooh. Yeah. Okay. okay. So now that we got the bad stuff out of the way. Yes. <clears throat> Let's get to the good stuff. Yay! Um, our top five Star Wars moments. I'm gonna I want to put a a couple of things in here just as honorable mentions because there's a couple of things that I really like that I'm waiting to see. One of them I'm waiting to see how it develops, and the other one there is a scene in Phantom Menace which I'd forgotten about. And I saw it again the other day when Kim had it on watching it because TNT ran them all over the weekend, and it's like. Um, I had forgotten about this moment, and it actually is pretty damn funny. And that's the moment where they're in there. It's near the end of the film, and Anakin's inside the X fighter, and he doesn't know what he's doing, and he starts playing with buttons, and suddenly the thing starts moving, and and it starts g- turning around toward the bad guys, and he finds a button that like starts shooting. That scene is hilarious, and I love that. And all I can say is, you know. I think Jake Lloyd got a bad rap for that film, number one. he's a, He was a good young actor. He's out of the business now, pretty much, and not acting anymore. But he was really good. But I've got to be honest, one of the other finalists for that role was Michael Angarano. Thank you for not giving Michael this role. His career would be over. Um, the other it one... It wasn't Jake so much as it was the script. It was. It was the script. The other one that I can't really say much about yet, but I'm looking forward to her continued development in the next two... Star Wars films is Mas Kanata. Um, despite the fact that that was another example of J.J. Abrams being just totally lazy, because it's it, it, Mas Kanata. Excuse me. Go back and look up Sergio Mendez in Brazil '66. Uh, there, there maybe is. Maybe he likes that song. Maybe he does, and he changed the spelling of it. But when when Han, Han was it Han the first part yeah. of her name? You will attest to this. They did not know what it was. I started. Cracking up. I was on the floor. It was like the ding a dong moment from me and Earl and the Dying Girl. Yeah. I'm like, oh my God. But I love that character and what little we've seen of her. And Lupita Nyango brings some incredible emotion and, and love to this CGI character. It's going to be interesting to see how she develops. Yeah. But so, she's rapidly becoming one of my favorite characters. So take this in just as, five minutes. Take this as a note of warning movie producers and directors and writers and stuff like that. If you think you're being so damn smart because you put some obscure musical reference into your movie... It doesn't have to be musical. But see Joe Quesada's X-Men Ultimate Universe and its first series, The Tomorrow People. Yeah. Right but, down to the logo. Yeah, but my my point being... And we called him on it, too. My point being, if you think you're being cute and no one's going to pick up on your obscure musical cue, he will. <laughs> <laughs> and he'll call you out for it, too. I will. Um, my number five on my best of list is actually the only thing that actually comes from Clone Wars, and it comes from the film, not the, mo- not the series. All right. And it is because... Um, and actually, it encompasses more than one scene. It encompasses the entire movie. But it is, I think, one of my favorite bits because Anakin 
has been this obnoxious, arrogant SOB all the way through Attack of the Clones. And I hate that movie. And it's like, I don't like that character anywhere but Clone Wars. I love him in Clone Wars. He's actually maturing. And the reason he's maturing is a 14-year-old apprentice he's saddled with named Ahsoka Tano. Yeah. I love Ahsoka Tano, my, one of my favorite characters in the entire Star Wars universe. And she starts off kind of whiny and draggy, but by the end of the film, she has kind of fallen into not so whiny, and they've kind of developed this kind of byplay with each other, even though Anakin still resents being saddled with her. Yeah. Ahsoka he call, grew... He calls her Snips. He ca- She calls him Sky Guy. Yeah. And Ahsoka grew throughout the four seasons of Clone Wars. Yeah. And I loved that character from the very beginning. And it's nice to know that George has said she did survive Order 66. Yes. So, and obviously because she's, she's also been on a yeah, Rebels. Yeah, because she had left, she had left the Jedi Order... She was expelled. Be- she was ex- no. She left. She w- she quit. Oh, I thought they expelled her. For no, some they reason. they okay. accused her of a crime and oh, she, she would have been expelled. She, so yeah. it was Nixon. She rather than be expelled, they, she left. Well, she was put on trial and they found out that she was not guilty. And then she was like, "I can't be a Jedi anymore," and left. And yeah. that was pre Order sixty six. Yeah. So. so it was. It that's was, a great. That's great. I love Ahsoka, and and I was so happy to see. Uh, the character grow. They didn't mm-hmm. let it stagnate. Jar Jar stagnated, which was one of the so quickly that he just so annoying from the very beginning. And I know people had trouble with her at first, but people eventually grew to love her too. Even the haters when they first th- saw Ahsoka as Clone Wars version of Wesley Crusher, Adric, uh, any number of science fiction characters. Uh, uh, what was the character's name? Lucas Walnacek, all, all these characters that mm-hmm. the adults hated from the classic TV sci-fi, but I loved Ahsoka and I always will. And uh, she is my number five, the introduction of Ahsoka Tano on, in Clone Wars, the movie. Okay, great. Um, my number five is actually something we already knew before we even saw the film. It's from The Phantom Menace, and it was something that we saw in almost every commercial. The thing that most people will talk about from The Phantom Menace, if you <laughs> ask people what was one of the things you, you got out of Phantom Menace that you thought was cool, looking, their answer is probably always going to be one one character, Darth Maul. He it's was, a pity he, he wasn't used very much. No. You even gave it, named an award after him. I did. Um, <laughs> our our year-end awards, we had the Darth Maul Award for a character who's hyped up in the in the... Trailers and posters for a film, and has you know, like kind of less than in the film. less than ten <laughs> minutes of screen time. But when he was on screen, he was compelling to look at because we'd never seen anybody like him before, and we'd never seen a weapon like his before. <laughs> My number five awesome Star Star Wars moment: Darth Darth Maul's double bladed lightsaber. Because I'm sorry, the second I saw that thing, I was like, holy cow, I need one of those in my life. No, you don't. <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> no, you don't. I deserve one. No, um, definitely not. <laughs> I mean, a lot You don't work well and play with uh, play well with others, you would not be able to use a double-edged light sword saver because people would end up in pieces. Anyway. You're such a buzzkill. You um, can't have a cape either. <laughs> anyway, go on. I'm I sorry. mean, a lightsaber on its own is obviously dangerous. You know, it's you know it can cut through pretty much anything, and it's incredibly cool looking. You take that and you take another lightsaber and then fuse them together, so you've got this where you can turn them. You can have one on. You can have both of them on. Oh my gosh! I it's was basically like, a lightsaber version of a bokeh, isn't it? Well, a bokeh you hold this way though, so it's, it's not more always. Like a, so you, you can do no, it sideways. I would say, no, I would say it's more of a bow staff. Okay, it's, well, it's that's a lightsaber. What I mean. Yeah, that's what I the mean. The bokeh is a sword. Oh, oh um, I'm sorry. Okay, I yeah. thought the so it's all right. My mistake. Um, Leave it for her to know this because she's. That's why I, I called that for it. No, it's that's a good that that's a really good comparison though. It, it, it is kind of a lightsaber version of a bow staff, but it's just looks awesome. 
I mean, it's the most... I, I realize I am coming off like a total geeky, McNerdly nerd here. I don't care. Don't judge me. Um, I just thought it was one of the coolest moments ever. My number five, Darth Maul's double-bladed lightsaber. Just... Let me have my moment. It's just... It's too cool. Yeah. My number four is... A moment that is actually kind of meant for humor in some ways, but it's actually quite a serious scene. After the interrogation of Ray by Kylo Ren, he makes the colossal oh. mistake of leaving this girl alone. Now, she's already having little bits and pieces of weird things happening, and, and she's heard about the Force and has this knowledge of old days. Somehow very convenient also, J.J. And there's also, um, you know, a, a, a gutsiness about her. So she just tries to try out the Force on the hapless stormtrooper that happens to be guarding her. And I'm like, okay, this is not going to go well, is it? On the third try, she finally gets, as Kim says, she gets the voice right know what that means there's no fear in her voice there's no nervousness her voice is completely calm and in okay control. so it works that that's why the stormtrooper who is daniel craig under all that armor drops you know i do love a man in uniform releases her and and drops his weapon on the way as he leaves the door yeah. and, and and she's able to escape the room and get away from creepy guy you know um you know emo emo kylo ren there um but that moment is, I think, one of the funniest moments in the entire Star Wars universe. And it makes it doubly more fun now that we know that that was Daniel Craig under that under that Stormtrooper outfit. Yeah. Kevin Smith is also in a Stormtrooper outfit somewhere in, in Force Awakens. Um, I, 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 I busted a gut when that happened in the movie. It was one of the few things that really... Lit me up for See, the I entire film. I think what film. happens after that is funnier, but that's just me. What is temper tantrum with the stormtroopers coming in yeah, and then turning around turning and walking around, away? Going the other way? Yeah, the one guy's like, "No, I think we're going the other way now." I my just... my number four, Ray discovers the Force to the hapless uh, mis um, misfortune of that particular stormtrooper <laughs> from from the Force Awakens. That's great. My number four is also from the Force Awakens, so that's nice. Um. Mine is a character. My favorite character in The Force Awakens, probably my favorite character forever in Star Wars now, um, besides Luke, because Luke will always have my heart. Um, you can't marry a droid. I know. Well, <laughs> I can't marry Luke either, but you know. No, but I'm, at least that would be more likely possible than Little eight-year-old than marry... me sitting there going, I'm going to marry that man. Which makes more sense <laughs> than you wanting to marry a droid. I don't want to marry like, him. Shaped like a, a basketball. I don't I want to cuddle him. He's so cute. <laughs> My number four, BB-8. I fell in love with this character. I was like, he is... I mean, besides the fact that he is just so damn cute. I mean, he really is. He's just adorable. The great thing is, he knows it. He yes. knows that he's... I actually like BB-8 a lot. I he give him crap, knows... but he's a very funny character. He knows and way that better than Olaf. people find him cute. He knows that people think that he's just uh, this little bundle of adorable, and he uses it. He's uh, And I like the fact that he's like, you know, just this little round orange ball of cuddly squee that can shock you. I think that's great. Um... For a character that doesn't speak in words we can understand, but Ray can, um, other and other characters as well. Obviously, Poe can understand him. The, the way that he just, the way he moves his head, it says so much. The way that his he, top cylinder. I wouldn't actually call it a head. Yeah, that's actually more accurate. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, I, I just think he's hilarious. I and I think that he's a very he's also a very sweet character. Yeah, he is. Because you can tell the scene where he where he tries to, for lack of a better word, wake up a powered down R two where he's kind of at first he's kinda of like, you know, beeping at him and trying to get his attention and that doesn't work. He kinda of just goes 
bonk, bonk, bonk. Yeah. <laughs> and there's something about that that I find so it's it's like a child trying to wake up a parent. You know, and there's like that kind of moment where you picture a kid jumping on the bed and jumping up and down. Wake up, mom! It's like that kind of a thing. I just love that character. I do. I can't help it. Uh, my number four, BB-8, who I hope we're going to see more of in future Star Wars movies that take pra- that take place in. The- this is going to get confusing. You're going to have the standalone movies and all these. Not other really. Things. I don't think because all the standalone movies fit within between movies. Yeah. So it's easy to figure them out. Mm. You know, so it'll it'll be interesting. I don't even need to go into number three because number three is is self explanatory from the quote. It's like I don't need to say anything. I don't need to describe it at all. It's just everybody's favorite line, I think, from the entire film. And and I like how could you not like this, even when you know that it's contrived and and a bit convenient and and again coincidence. Uh, really at, at at bay here where everything just happens to come together just right and make the perfect circumstances come together for this particular moment. But the moment was blown because they decided to put it in the trailer and that was so stupid. It really was. My number three, Chewy, we're home. <laughs> From The Force Awakens, uh, Harrison Ford back as Han Solo. Uh, Han Solo, excuse me. Don't want to get pronunciation people freaking out at me. And and uh, that look in his eyes when he says that and the, and the catch in his voice. But gee, isn't it just convenient where they happen to be? And gee, isn't it just convenient that the Millennium Falcon happened to fly by them? And gee, isn't it convenient? That whole bit is so contrived. I mean, I, <coughs> I love the movie. I do. I, I did like Force Awakens. I gave it a B. And it's a good film. But there's bits and pieces of it that make me crazy. And that's one of them, but it's still sweet. Chewy, I'm home from The Force Awakens, we're, number we're three. Home, yeah. I, I gotta be on the first time <laughs> I saw that trailer and that happened, I kind of cried a little. Um, <laughs> don't judge me. Um, At least it's not the sad... We actually had an incident. Kim had an incident. When the trailer for Where the Wild Things Are came out, we were looking at it, and we thought, this is going to be so great. And and she's like, oh my God, they did it right. And then we saw the movie, and like, what went wrong? Yeah. That could have happened with Force Awakens. Thankfully, it didn't. So, anyway. My number three is going to seem like... I don't know. I wouldn't. I don't consider it a cheat or a cop out or anything like that. It's just for me. It's it's just that moment for me. <laughs> My number three is from Star Wars. That first time when the music hits and the titles start scrolling up the screen and we start seeing, you know, it. Why would you consider that a cop out or a? What, what, well, what it's not it, because it's not a scene. It's, yeah, it is, well, it's, that that sets up the entire film. That's definitely the first scene of the film. Okay, all right, absolutely. Um, you well, know, BB-8's not exactly I've seen either, but you know, the whole you know it's the whole thing about being you know, dark days for the Rebel Alliance and the evil Galactic Empire and all this stuff with like that and Death Star in these in all caps and all this stuff with like that. <laughs> While this John Williams music is just pounding your ears like like the surf at the ocean. And I just, like I said, I mean, I've said this before and I'll say it again, probably till the day I die. I I remember that feeling. And when I hear that music and I see that part of the of Star Wars, I'm that little kid again. I'm that little <laughs> kid from the suburbs sitting there in a movie theater in the dark and, and looking up at the screen and feeling something. And that was I, the re- moment Kim's life changed forever. Yep. And I realize some people are probably like, that's so melodramatic, but it's true. It's not. And the next thing I'm going to say is going to sound totally hokey. I don't care. (laughs) Something in my soul vibrated like a plucked string from a harp. It was just something inside me resonated and it got louder and louder and louder. And I was like, I want more. I want to feel like this all the time. 
I, you know, I want to feel this this sense of wonder and amazement. And and I'm just, I'm a little kid, not even ten years old, and I'm thinking like, this is. Yeah, she was eight when this came you know, out. This is important. This isn't just a movie. This is important to me mm-hmm. as a person. Mm-hmm. And I had never felt that about a movie ever before in my life until that moment in that seat in that theater. So my number three is the first time we see the titles and hear the music for Star Wars. That isn't the only time that that's ever happened to you, though. No, it's not the only time, but it's the first time. Right, and then Godzilla. Those two stand out way above everything else. Yeah. My number two is everybody's favorite moment, I think, from the Star Wars universe, at least from the original three movies. And I might be wrong, but it's it was made better. One of the few things that was made better by the special edition Star Wars that came out in 1997. We already talked about it earlier. Mm-hmm. Watching Luke fly down that... Uh, that trench. trench and is and he's an X-wing isn't he yeah shooting and hitting that that target just so perfectly and flying out and coming back in and then without any warning you get this explosion <laughs> and this huge metallic that's no moon it's a spaceship flies apart every last ounce of it and then, of course, added with the Praxis wave and the boom sound in the, in the later version, the destruction of the Death Star from Star Wars, my number two moment. Okay. My number two um, favorite Star Wars moment is actually from two different films. Um, the first moment is from The Empire Strikes Back. The second moment is from Return of the Jedi. In The Empire Strikes Back, before Han is encased in carbonite to be carted off by Jabba, <laughs> to, to Jabba the Hutt by Boba Fett, um, he's standing in the the chamber that they're going to flood with the carbonite to in, to hi, you know put him in forced hibernation, or it may kill him, whichever. And Leia and Chewie are forced to watch this, and Leia looks at Han and calls out to him, I love you. And Han looks at her and Han Solo to the last says, I know. <laughs> now we flash forward to the next film, Return of the Jedi and the battle on on the planet Endor, on the, on the moon of Endor. And the, the, the two of them are back together again, Han and Leia, and they've been cornered by a stormtrooper. Leia's pressed up against the wall and has already been wounded um, and Han is in front of her using his body as a shield between her and the, and the approaching stormtrooper he looks down and see that she, sees that she's very slowly pulling out, she's got a blaster and he looks up at her he looks up, looks at her, looks her in the face and grins and he's like I love you and she looks back at him and says I know. <laughs> it's, oh man, I loved that. Loved it, loved it, loved it, loved it, loved it. It was just the coolest. I, I just think it's one of the best juxtapositions that they did. And those characters were so great together. And I loved it. I just thought it was fantastic. So the whole I love you, I know, which comes full circle between Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi. It's a shame that it didn't last. Well, it, well last- it did last, but it didn't last physically. Yeah. And spiritually, they never stopped loving each other. No. And he never stopped loving her. And no. Well, she never stopped loving him either. They I just couldn't she- get along. No, you, they were like, you know, they were. it was like they were bad together, but they were worse apart. Yeah. You know. It was, it's a great relationship. My number one moment in the Star Wars universe actually comes from The Force Awakens. And I, I really think that it's... Um, there are so many battles throughout the entire Star Wars uh, universe. You've got the the battle between um, Obi Wan and Darth Vader in Star Wars. You've got later battles between Luke and Darth Vader, and 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 you know uh, Qui Gon Jinn and and Anakin and other people in, in in the in the various sequels. But in the Force Awakens, at the end of the film. Um, it it becomes immediately 
obvious that Ray is definitely in tune with the Force when she has been given the lightsaber of Luke Skywalker by Mas Kanata. And you go keep point. Um, she doesn't have it with her, but as she's running from the to try and get away from things going on, she knows she's going to have to fight eventually. But right now she's trying to get herself a little ground. Finn has already been hurt and is unconscious. And Kylo Ren looks at that, sees that sword that's now, which he, which uh, Finn had been using and now Ray is using. Finn didn't really know what he was doing. For some reason, Ray has an immediate command of that lightsaber. And oh my God, this is the best single one on one battle in the entire history of the films. I loved this sequence because Kylo Ren is desperate to take her out and get bring her to the dark side too. I mean, Kylo is the product of Han and Leia mm -hmm. and worships his late grandfather who doesn't make any sense since his grandfather came back to the good side. Yeah. But, you know, I, I'm picking nits. Um, the force in, in, the, in the actions of this scene are as important as everything that it means. Um... And what I mean by that is anybody who knows choreography, fight choreography of any kind, but particularly mm -hmm. sword fight choreography, it can be a bitch to shoot and make it look good. Adam Driver and Daisy Ridley are spot on in this entire fight. It is beautiful to look at. It is well animated in the sword's parts. You really cannot find a better sword fight anywhere except maybe in Hero. Mm -hmm. And that's through everything ever seen in Wuxia films and everywhere else. This is a sword fight, and maybe Crouching Tiger too. This is a sword fight to end sword fights. And those two have such great chemistry together that I'm looking forward to seeing them fight more in the next few movies. Uh -huh. <laughs> My number one, the battle between Kylo Ren and Rey at the end of The Force Awakens. Okay, cool. That's a great choice. <laughs> My number one is it's beautiful, but it's also very, very, very sad. Um, it is at almost to the end of Return of the Jedi. And Darth Vader has killed Emperor Palpatine, who was trying to kill Luke. Um, but in the process of doing this, has wound up gravely wounded. And the the Death Star is being attacked. The the being the rebuilt Death Star is being attacked. And Luke is trying to get his father on the ship to get him off of this almost built Death Star, which is almost going to be destroyed. And Vader asks Luke for help taking off his mask. And Luke is completely horrified by this idea. He's like, he, you know, he's like, but you'll, you'll die. And Vader says that, that it doesn't, he basically says it doesn't matter. That, that, you know, he's dying already. He knows he's dying. He can feel it. Mm -hmm. And he says, just for once... Let me look at you with my own eyes. And Luke helps him take off the top of the Vader helmet. And he sees this man, this pale, scarred figure that is his father. And it's just this really beautiful scene where... And it's not Darth Vader anymore. This is Anakin Skywalker, the man. Mm -hmm. He still existed. And he's telling Luke to leave to, you know, to get off the ship. And Luke's like, no, you're coming with me. I'll not leave you here. I've got to save you. And Anakin looks at him and he says, you already have Luke. <laughs> and the scene goes on from there, ending with Vader's death. And I was a mess. And is. And I Every time am, she sees it. Yes, fine. <laughs> I cried when Darth Vader died. I am a complete and total... No, yeah. no. You cried when Anakin Skywalker did, died. Yeah, I did. And I did. Um, <laughs> it is such a beautiful scene. It is so intimate and, and well shot. And 
the emotion from both actors, Sebastian Shaw and Mark Hamill, is it is so moving and just so beautiful. I mean, it's an incredibly sad scene, but it's also, it's the reuniting of a father and his child, and it's just beautiful. So my number one best Star Wars moment from Return of the Jedi, father reuniting with his son. Yay! So there you got it, all the yeah. way up. My worst five were, uh, my number one is the 20-something Anakin with the 50 exchange. Number two, Jar Jar Banks, everything except Clone Wars. Number three, it just happened to be the Millennium Falcon from The Force Awakens. Number four, Obi Wan went nuts at the end of Revenge of the Sith. And number five, Revisionist History, Greedo shot first. Okay. Um, my number one from worst moment from The Phantom Menace, Midichlorians. Uh, from my number two, Revenge of the Sith. Um, the whole thing of. Obi Wan just leaving Anakin to burn to death. <laughs> uh, number three, Return of the Jedi, swapping out old Anakin for young Anakin. Number four, Attack of the Clones, the death of Shmi. And number five from uh, Revenge of the Sith, the very melodramatic no. My favorite moments overall, my number one favorite moment is the battle between Rey and Kylo Ren for The Force Awakens. Number two, the destruction of the Death Star from Star Wars, the special edition. Number three, Chewie, we're home from The Force Awakens. Number four, uh, Rey discovers the Force in The Force Awakens. And number five, the introduction of Ahsoka Tano from Clone Wars. Okay. Uh, my best uh, top five Star Wars moments from Return of the Jedi, the father and son reunion. Number two, from The Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi, I Love You, I Know. Number three, from Star Wars, the first time we see the, the title crawl. Uh, number four, The Force Awakens, BB-8. Uh -huh. And number five, um, the, the Phantom Menace, Darth Maul's double-bladed lightsaber. I still don't see how that hilt works on Kylo Ren's thing. I can't believe he's not, like, cutting off fingers every time he turns his lightsaber on. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> so that's our Star Wars moments. Don't forget, we'll have a review of Rogue One this weekend on Subject Cinema. And uh, next time, it's my choice. It is. And we're going to be headed toward the holiday once and for all. It's our last show before the holiday. So I'm also going to do a 5 and 5 next week. Our top five best and top five worst Christmas holiday specials. And I don't mean variety specials like Perry Como and Bob Hope. I'm talking animated, special Christmas movies, or, or lifetime movies, whatever. The five favorite Christmas special movies, specials, whatever, and five worst. I already know what's going to be at number one on your worst list. <laughs> I think everybody does. <laughs> so that's what we're doing next time, and that'll be next Wednesday. And until then, we got uh, Subject Cinema on uh, Sunday. This this week, we'll have more catch-up films as we get closer and closer to Christmas Eve and our first of two big award shows, the Just Cause We Can show, followed on, Chris on New Year's Eve by our year-end awards, the Poppies and Rosies, our 12th annual Poppies and Rosies. Mm -hmm. And in between those two shows, we'll have a 10 or 15-minute special announcing our top films of the year. That'll be on uh, Wednesday that week in place of this show or with this show, one of the two. We haven't decided yet. Mm -hmm. So uh, that'll be there, too. This is the longest episode of the show we've ever had. Yeah, I know. Um, oh, I kind of knew it would be. Plus, don't forget, uh, Three Minute Weekend on Friday with all the latest film releases in the U.S. and Tuesday Digidex with all the latest DVD, Blu-ray, and uh, streaming releases in the U.S. Platinum Rose's Garden, uh, normally on uh, Saturday nights. She's off for the helatus yeah. until January. Mm -hmm. um, but it'll be back at PlatinumRose'sGarden.com in January. Mm -hmm. And Cave Babble with Eric and Valerie Lyon at CaveBabble.com. Great shows over there. We hope you'll check them all out. And join us on our website, eCinema One. We have been having all kinds of coverage. I'm a couple of days behind. i got to get the SAG Awards and all that up. But there's all kinds of stuff uh, award-wise. Uh, oh, and I forgot to do my daily trailer today, too. I didn't have time to get it done. I've been doing awards trailers all week. Uh, stuff that's making the rounds at the award ceremonies and stuff. Um, and, and all that's coming up every day during award season on eCinema1.com. And I hope you'll check it out. And also, 
If you like this show or any of our other shows or our websites, we ask that you come aboard as a Patreon sponsor. Patreon is uh, a great way to give a little dough and a little thumbs up to the people that you like listening to. And if you like listening to us, please take time to donate at least a couple bucks. There's all kinds of perks all the way up to 100 bucks, And we got a few new perks coming. As soon as I can get together with Eric, we got a new perk from him coming and a few other things. And uh, we hope that you'll check it out. You can click on the big, giant, orange Patreon button on any of the websites, or you can go directly to patreon.com backslash PNR Networks. And remember, your donation doesn't fund just one show or one site. It funds everything we do. So please join us. And that's it for another week here on Front Row 5 and 10. We hope you'll come back. We hope you'll keep us at the top of your list, too. I'm Kim Brown. I'm T.C. Kirkham. We'll see you with our holiday special next week. The Force will be with you always. 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 You've been listening to Front Row 5 and 10 with Kim Brown and T.C. Kirkham. Podcasting's choice from coast to coast, continent to continent, right here 24 7.